The Codpast. Hello and welcome to The Codpast. I'm your host, Sean Douglas, and this is the place where you'll hear right brain stories from interesting individuals. Today's guest is a direct descendant of William Woodhove, the inventor of the lifeboat, has had a staggering 17 different jobs and is a proper sand dancer lass. Today's guest is MP for South Shields, Emily Orbuck. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. Nice to have you on the show today. Also nice to have a Geordie accent. I, I quite like the Geordie accent when I was a kid and I do feel like I'm in an episode of Biker Grove at the moment. <laughs> you know what? I very rarely hear other Geordie accents when I'm down here. So if I do, I generally gravitate towards those people because <laughs> it just makes you feel a bit more like you're at home. <laughs> Indeed. And I mean, for some of our listeners, especially our American listeners, they may not understand some of the slang that you use. So I've brought here mm. with me my uh, Geordie dictionary. <laughs> I'm just going to go through a couple of things just to, to make sure we uh, know some of the things that you might be talking about so um we've got here argy argy that's a fight isn't yeah it? having an yeah. argument yeah. yeah badly liked badly liked yeah I, I badly like this soup oh you really like it yeah. uh here it says dislike badly ah, like right and um everyone's favorite canny Oh, well, that just means you're a good person. It's proper canny. Yeah, you're dead canny. <laughs> Sean, you're a canny lad. So let's, let's hope this <laughs> is a canny interview. <laughs> so, I mean, we've got over the confusion of, of some of the, the words that you may use. But the, the other thing that I guess a lot of our listeners will be a little bit confused about is dyspraxia. So we talk about dyslexia a lot. And probably if you go through our back catalogue, you'll understand a lot about dyslexia. But it's quite often that people have dyslexia. They have a bit of dyspraxia, maybe some dysgraphia. You have dyslexia, but your your, dyslex- your dyspraxia is a bit more prominent. And, and can you just tell us a little bit about what dyspraxia is? I find it sometimes difficult to talk about because I didn't get diagnosed until I was in my late 20s. And for me, it's just life. It's just who I am. Mm. So I find it really difficult trying to pare it down because for me, it's just things that are. Like when I got the diagnosis, my parents and all my friends read it and said, well, that is just you, though. There's nothing spectacular here. What? I didn't realise there was a name for it. So, yeah. And that's how I've always looked at it. But a lot of it is around spatial awareness. So I could be approaching, for example, I could be approaching somebody in the corridor and I will think they're closer to me than they actually are. Um, problems sometimes with basic things like left and right, problems with coordination, because it goes back to that your brain's wired a bit differently. So the world you're living in isn't set up for you because it's set up for the norms of other people. So you kind of often, I'm very clumsy. When I was little, everyone in the family would say, oh, Emma's just a clumsy bane. <laughs> kind of, you know, when I used to go to my auntie's house, I was never allowed a drink in the sitting room. I had to either go in the kitchen or the garden because you could guarantee it would end up all over the carpet. And she liked to keep her house nice. <laughs> so, you know, just little things like that. And you just grow up thinking, okay, I'm clumsy. It takes me a bit longer to do things, but you know what? So what? <laughs> mm. And you said you described it to me before as, um, as it's as if someone's kind of taken your head off your body and you're, you're mm. looking at the world from yeah. a quite a weird perspective. So your, your head will see something, but your body's in a completely different place. Yes. Yeah, which, you know, I, I suppose some people would say that when they're drunk, wouldn't they? <laughs> so, you know, again, it's not it's not something that's insurmountable. And there is people who do have extremes of dyspraxia. You know, some people have verbal difficulty. I don't find that so much, but I do find sometimes if I'm under pressure or I'm a bit stressed, that words will come out a bit jumbled. But then people always just think, oh, it's just Emma, she's a bit quirky and she's a bit, you know, she's a bit she's a bit wacky so we'll just let her get away with it but it's not it's just literally because they haven't formulated in my head yeah and um I guess you know you you said quirky is one of those things and you sometimes come across quirky but I think as a kid you may be quirky in kind of other ways I mean maybe your contemporaries were looking at Sunderland United and going I want to do that you were looking at Prime Minister's Question Time and going, yeah, that's where I want to yes. be. It's quite weird for a kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I was always um, obsessed. I think because the, at the time I was growing up, that was on the news a lot. I was always obsessed with um, Russia and the Cold War and what was happening there. And, and obviously a lot of my family are shipyard workers. So I was always watching them go off on strikes or the Thatcher government. So things like that, even though I didn't identify that as politics, it, it obviously was. And my nana said to my mom once, you need to get something done about that kid. She's not right, Linda, <laughs> because she's she doesn't do the things that other kids do. And, yeah. I, and I never did. Really. But that was quite a weird kind of direction for you to want to go because mm. you're quite an introverted child weren't you 
yeah, it, so it was a dream. You know, politics was something, as I got older, that I dreamed about, but thought, you know what, um, shy, quiet kids from my background don't get to come to parliament it just doesn't happen you know you watch you watch television and you see people talking in parliament even now the most prominent players you'll watch them in any kid at home now watching and think well they're they're just not like me Mm. you know people at the dispatch box don't sound like me or look like me and it's still that way now and occasionally you know there's people on the back benches like myself mainly on the labor side who do have an accent and do look and sound like their community but we don't we don't get the prominent news spots that other people get so mm. I used to always think it, it was a dream and it was something that you needed to be a bit more confident perhaps a bit cleverer than I was. For you at that time you thought a career in politics was impossible and you went out mm. and you, you got a load of other jobs I mean 17 different jobs can you tell mm. me about some of them? Yeah um, I think it, I think it was um, was it 17 or 14 I'm not entirely sure I'll have mm. to check but I worked in bars, restaurants. Um, one of the most interesting jobs I had was it was like an American company and you had to sing a song called Juicy Profits. <laughs> so we all had to stand around, hold hands and sing the Juicy Profits song, then get our bags and go out and basically sell in pubs and on the street. And like, you know, a bit like Del Boy style, like, you know, two dusters for 50 pence, lads <laughs> and lasses and all this. And then whatever you made, you had to go back at the end of the night. And if anyone made over 40 quid, you had to ring the juicy profit bell and we all used to have to stand around and clap and sing again. It was absolutely dire. But I've always been one of those people that I will get work, I will do work wherever I can. Yeah. I didn't like, I was on the dole briefly and I didn't like it. And my dad was on the dole a lot when the ship industry was in decline. And I know what that can do to someone mentally, not just, you know, the fact that you don't have the money. And I thought, I never, I never want to be out of work. I would literally do anything. Um, I was a cleaner in the Metro Centre, which is one of the biggest shopping complexes in yeah, Europe. I know the Metro Centre. The last job I did before I came into Parliament was a social worker, mm. a child protection social worker. You were an introverted child, but you had to be quite extrovert. And being mm-hmm. a social worker, obviously there's a lot of stuff yeah. where you're helping people, but it, I assume it can be quite intense and potentially violent at some points. It's a, it's a, it was an incredibly violent job. And I think some people's experience of child protection, social work aren't that bad, but mine, mine were quite horrible. Um, I remember regularly getting beaten up. I remember instances being in someone's house where they had us by the throat while I was holding one, each one of their babies in my arms. Um, I remember having police alarms in my house, getting taken under security to give evidence in court. So, you know, all of those things do do give you a resilience but at the same time it's hard to keep going back in day after day and not knowing what you're going to be met with after you've had a traumatic experience the day before and there's social workers right across the country working in that environment it's dangerous and it's frightening and each day you get up and you go and you keep doing it not knowing how the day is going to end if you're going to be hurt or if you're going to if someone's going to reveal something horrific to you but I used to always think well if I was getting hurt, then the children I was supposed to be protecting weren't getting hurt. And if someone did tell me something horrific that had happened to them, I knew so I could help them and stop it from happening again. Mm. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's one of those jobs where the highs are really high and the lows are really low. There's kind of no in between. So you would never say, oh, you know, I had an okay day at work today. It was either it was absolutely horrendous and I hate my job and want to leave or isn't my job amazing and I can't wait to go back tomorrow. Mm. So it's quite an emotional job. It's quite tough. And I mean, even though it was a a challenging job and an enjoyable Mm. job, you still couldn't shake that that bit of your head that said, I should be in Parliament. I never was really open about it because, you know, I used to think still it's it's a dream and people would laugh and go, you know, she she thinks she's going to be an MP one day. Little Emma from Jara. So I always just thought, well, I'll keep pursuing it and, and see what happens. When I was 24, I was the one of the youngest ever councillors in our borough of South Tyneside. And while I was on the council, what I started to realise even more starkly is that councils carry out laws that are made in this place. And, Westminster. Yeah, and when you've got when you've got laws that are being made wrong and you've worked in certain environments and you know that that's wrong, the best place to be is here because this is where you can change that law or implement another law to to soften the blow of that one. So I wanted even more to be in Parliament then. So you, you became a councillor and I think when you started as councillor, you still were a little bit shy and you still were, I guess, a little bit Im- intimidated by the kind of con- uh, prospect of being a PC, PC? Yeah. MP. <laughs> um, 
And so you, how, how did you prepare yourself for that? What, what was the process you went through to try and okay. make yourself into MP material? You know, there, there was some people on the council who literally they got elected and the next day they, they were on their feet making noise and doing things. That's never been me. I've always been a bit of a slow burner because I don't ever want to let people down who've put their faith in us. So I will make sure whenever I do anything that I've, I've really well researched it and thought about it. So I remember just, you know, watching watching people in the council chamber, understanding the dynamics and then what I used to do was force myself into situations that I hated, like public speaking, which I didn't, I never felt 100% comfortable with. So I used to deliberately force myself into situations because the more you do something, the better you get at it. Um, there was training courses about, you know, how to be a, a kind of a better counsellor, I suppose. I did a lot of work with the Labour Women's Network, which helps Labour women who want to have office in public life. And I just kept on doing that and, and working at it. Really, mm. it's, you know, in every single time it, it did get a little bit easier, but I don't think public speaking ever gets easy. And I think at the time it does get easy is the time when you need to stop doing it because you've lost your passion and you don't care. If you care about what you're saying, then you should have a bit of nervousness. You should have a bit of adrenaline. If you just stood there and it's just going through the motions, then you, you've kind of lost it, I think. Mm. Do you think that's something politics has lost? Because you do have these quite slickly written speeches and mm. they do sometimes come off in genuine. Do you think that's an issue? I think it is. And I think it's especially an issue when we've we've kind of entered the period now where, well, not now, I suppose it was before now where you had like the professional politician. Mm. So you have people who've done nothing in their lives but politics. And I'm not knocking that. Some of those people are fantastic and really good at what they do and they've done some great things. But I think you need a mixture and you need a mix of voices. Parliament should, you know, people have said it's a cliche, but Parliament should look like the country it represents. Mm. And it never has done. Yeah. And it still doesn't. We're getting better at it, but it still doesn't. And I think there's space for all of those voices. But I think the professional politician is the predominant voice. And that's why you sometimes have policies that are bereft of any common sense or real world knowledge because people have never done anything but been in this building. Mm. And if you've never had a job outside of this, you don't know, you just don't get it. You don't know what it feels like to worry about paying the bills. You don't know what it feels like to have to go and stand and sign on the dole. You don't know what it feels like to not be able to afford to live. And you certainly don't know what it feels like to be, you know, in a situation where you're being persecuted by your boss or, you know, all of those things are just alien. Mm. And I think, you know, if you're representing people who are going through stuff like that, it, you always have to have an element of you, that you get it and you understand it and you know what it's like. Mm. And you can talk to thousands of people and read thousands of books, but you're still never going to get it. Yeah. And I guess that's the position South Shields was in when you were a councillor. Ed Miliband was the MP of the area. Da it was David. Um, oh, David sorry, yeah, yeah, that's OK. Um, David was, from what I've heard from people when he first when he first arrived, I think he, he kind of um, took a little while to settle in. But I think anyone would in a new area, in a new seat. But people in Shields loved David and, mm. you know, he, he put us on the map and he did he did some great things when he was in government. But when he uh, he left, mm -hmm. that became an opportunity for Shields to get someone who looked like them. Well, I think the issue for Shields is that it's never, ever had an MP who was born there. So I think people were kind of thinking, well, is this not an opportunity now for us for us to get somebody who, who was born here, yeah, who does live local in you know, in a woman as well. What gave you the confidence to do that? I mean, you, you've done all of that preparation, yeah. you've been on all of those mm -hmm. courses, but that's yeah. still quite um, a daunting task. And yeah. especially in politics where you are putting yeah. yourself out there. I mean, it's terrifying. And you know, I had, I had a lot of, I've got a great family and support of friends who've always kind of wanted us to, to get to where I wanted to be and have always helped out and always like, you know, I, my mum is great because I'll practice all my speeches on my mum and sometimes even now if I'm not sure on something I'll send her it and go do you have a look at that see what you think because she'll know what if she's kind of a litmus test <laughs> you know if you show someone else in here they might think it's brilliant but mm. I'm not speaking to people in here I'm speaking to my constituency and sometimes when you're down here for especially towards the end of the week if you've been here since Monday Days here are very long, so you can feel like you've been here for months. So you do get into a bubble quite quickly. That's why I like to go home every single week. 
And so you, what you think is really good is perhaps not as good and you're not speaking. So I, I always use people in the constituency or local party members and I'll say, I was thinking of saying this like this, what do you think? Would it go down well? So, you know, you've got it. I just think every word you say is vitally important and should never be just off the cuff or flippant. And the seat that you went for, it was quite um, a battle really, wasn't it? Because it was a safe seat. So it was very yeah. likely that you'd win it quite yes, easily. Yeah. And when I asked you what that was like, the word you used to describe it was brutal. Yeah. I think when it comes to seats that are safe, you have a lot of people wanting that seat. And, you know, politics is a dirty game. It's not, you know, it can be tough and it can be brutal, but you've just got to ride it out. And I've always just had this strong belief that if you're honest and you're open and you do the right thing, it might take you longer to get somewhere. You mightn't get things as quick as other people, but by God, when you get there, you'll probably stay there a hell of a lot longer than they ever would have. And I think that's the good way to to handle politics. I don't think it has to be dirty. Someone said to me once, um, do you think you'll survive when after I got elected because you, you're not dirty enough? And I said, well, I said, yeah, I think I will. I said, because the people who do, who perhaps don't want me to be here are dirty and they'll have something to hide. I've got nothing to hide. I'm totally transparent. I'm totally open. I'm just doing the job the best of my ability. What can you do with someone like that? There's, you, you, it's very hard to to attackers really, I suppose. Mm. Can you yeah. take me through the process? Because it happened quite quickly, didn't it? There was an application process, then pretty much 24 hours later, you get a call to see whether you're through to the next stage. And then after that, there's an interview process. I had to come to London for that interview. Um, and then after the interview process, you get a call to see whether you're through to the next stage. And then the next stage, normally you have perhaps like a few months or a bit of time to lobby local party members, to ask them to choose you as their candidate. But because it was a by-election in, you know, in quite high profile circumstances, um, I found out I'd passed the interview on the Saturday and the Huston's event where the members voted was on the Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So again, it was all very, everything had to be done so quickly. And I literally just had a small little band of family, friends and volunteers helping us. And we'd never, we'd never run an election before. And, and what was it like when you found out you'd, you'd won? Um, I cried. <laughs> and I've, I've never been one to hide my emotions and I don't think you should I think you know if if you if you feel something then just let people say it there's no shame in that and I, I cried quite a lot actually <laughs> yeah I was happy but at the same time I was a bit shocked I w and I would say probably for a good year after I was elected I still had that rabbit in the headlights look like, I can't believe this has actually happened to me I was going through the, I was doing the job but it was still every so often I'd have to pinch myself because it'd be non-stop and I think it was when we had we had parliamentary recess when I was eventually settled and got things in order. And I kind of looked at my husband and said, oh my God, we did it. And he went, yeah, we did, didn't we? <laughs> it was like, we've been doing it for months, but I hadn't realised because it was just such a such a rush and such a, an adrenaline. Yeah. What do you think it was about you that, that, that allowed you to win? Oh, God knows. Because <laughs> I had that real life experience. I could draw on concrete examples in my speech. I could talk about how I understood what people were going through, but also that in my work in the council, my work as a social worker, things that I'd implemented to soften those blows for people. So I actually had practical, concrete, proven examples of things that I'd done, regeneration schemes that I'd started, schools that I'd saved from closing, sheltered accommodation for the elderly that I'd kept open when it was due to close. Um, big regeneration projects. I was part of the team that was involved in building the second Tyne Tunnel, which runs um, between North Shields and South Shields in Jarrow. So I, I managed to do, I could, in they, these were things that people could see, people could look on their street and go, yeah, she, she got that built or she did that. So I think that was probably the, maybe it's what clinched it in mm. that I did all of that with, you know, socialist values at the heart of it and did it with people. I've never been one that does things to people. Every single th one of those things that I did, I did with people, took people with us and listened to them constantly about it. I don't know, maybe that just came through. Mm. And when you finally got to Parliament, I mean, you as a kid sitting, watching yeah. Prime Minister's Question Time, not seeing anyone that represented you, what was it like then you coming into Parliament? I mean, how did you feel? I was a bit shocked at how everybody already knew each other even before they'd got yeah, Obviously I came in the by-election so people did already know each other because they'd all came in, in in an intake together. But just the fact that 
a lot of them even who'd came in in an intake together had all either worked together before or had some contact or been in national political circles so they, they all went way way back so I felt like a huge outsider I felt like I was um you know when you you know when you watch those films and the, a kid turns up at school from somewhere else and everyone's like oh who are they it was a bit like that and nobody could quite judge us or ha- knew how to take us because I hadn't been mixing in those circles for years like everyone else nobody I was a bit of an anomaly mm. but then I was used to that so it's fine <laughs> I mean does parliament live up to what you thought it would because a lot of politicians that I've spoken to or people in politics mm. they go into parliament and politics with you know, really good ideas and really mm. good notions. Um, but when they get here, they realise how difficult it is to actually change things. Well, having been a social worker and having to fight for, you know, sometimes 12 months just to get something tiny done for the benefit of a child, I was used to fighting hard battles. So it's not something alien to me. I know that if you have to, if you want to affect change, you've got to keep at it and keep at it and keep going and don't run out with energy because people are relying on you to, to solve it for them. And yeah, it's harder but that's opposition. Can you talk, talk about some of the things that you've kind of gone through that process with? Um, I've started a campaign back in 2014 on funeral poverty. So there are still people who can't afford to bury their loved ones. And I think for me, that's the, you know, austerity. Lots of people talk about austerity. Lots of people talk about people not being able to afford to live and, you know, working and having to go to food banks. No one talks about that other element of it where you can't even afford to do that one last thing for your loved one and bury them. And people are getting into debt. There's hundreds and thousands of people in this country who haven't been able to afford to pay for a funeral for someone they love. I think that's absolutely tragic. And it's not spoken about. But if you look now, if you look prior to me launching my bill, there was no one really talking about if you look now it's in the daily mirror quite a lot there's debates in parliament quite a lot so i've got it on the agenda and i'm just plugging away and plugging away and trying bit by bit to get it implemented when you first brought up the notion of funeral poverty how was it received um lots of people privately got in touch and said um that you know <clears throat> thank you thank you for raising this because I've been through it and people from right across the country, but I'm, I would never have told anyone. And, you know, it was really brave of you to talk about it and to bring it up. Um, some other people kind of, the, the press jumped on a comment that I'd made about some people burying relatives in their back garden. And everyone thought I was a laughing stock. But then there was a big phone in the following day on, um, I think it was the Jeremy Vine show. And people were ringing up and saying, well, actually, yeah, I know, I know people have done that. So, you know, stop laughing at that. It's it's again, that dyspraxia thing. You know, we, we kind of know things are going on. We think outside the box. We talk to people. And you talked about, you know, we go back to you talking about you being an introvert and things. Mm. And I think with dyslexia and dyspraxia, you do sometimes come out with ideas that people just don't see the end goal because you can see so far ahead Mm. and they think your ideas are crazy and I've been shut down a lot of times with my ideas and it does take a lot of strength to keep getting back up when you have been knocked down and especially in parliament it is quite a volatile place and then you have got the press Mm. how do you find the strength to to keep getting up and not be afraid of that um sometimes you kind of think oh you know I'm a are they right and am I am I on the wrong track yeah and then other times I just think oh you know I feel really sorry for you because I'm seeing something that's decent I'm seeing something that's an issue and a problem and all you can do is shout ridiculous insults I kind of think if that's how you get your kicks then you must lead quite a sad little life <laughs> <laughs> and, and being a dyspraxic politician I mean what do you think a dyspraxic politician brings to this place well I think it's that thinking outside the box again isn't it you know, um, just, just the other day I was having a conversation. I'll not get into it because it's really complicated. I was having a conversation and someone said, but no, that's never been done before and it's against the law. And I was like, but we make the laws in here. So let's just change the law. Let's work to change the law. And then that no longer will be against the law and then it will be possible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're met with blank faces and they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think sometimes people forget that, that, you know, we, we, have the, we have this amazing opportunity as MPs to do these things. Yet sometimes people still think, oh, no, that's never been done before. You can't do that. Of course you can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're, in the, we're in the very place where you can do that. You found out you were dyspraxic quite late when you were 27. Mm-hmm. Do you think things have changed or do you think you've gone on a journey a positive journey since you found out that you were dyspraxic I think when 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 I first found out I shelved the report and got on with my job because I thought well I'm not gonna 
and just got on with what I was doing because I thought I'm not going to make a big deal about it because I just want to get on with my life and have a job and it's everything that I already knew about myself just now it had a name and then it was when I came to parliament the researcher who was working for us at the time said do you know that um he said I've spotted something that you've got dyspraxia I went oh yeah and he went do you know there's actually like a national organization called the dyspraxia foundation that works with people and he said you know they'd probably love it if you got in touch and I was like really <laughs> it's a national foundation <laughs> and I was thinking well, there must be a lot more naively I just never looked into it um and I met them and they're like yeah there's loads of people across the country and I would never forget sitting down with the women from the dyspraxia foundation it was downstairs in the building we're in now and just something clicked and I just felt really overly emotional I was like there's loads of other people who who think like me and feel like me and I didn't even realize they existed and that foundation has gave me like the courage to talk about it and and make other people know that it's okay it's fine it's not you know you're just a little bit different and being different has never harmed anyone in fact if you look at people who stand out in the world they are different Mm. so what's next for you leader of the Labour Party oh god no (laughs) (laughs) I think that's I think that's way way you know that's not something that I aspire to do I would love actually to see my party get back into government I would love it if the people of Shields continued to want me to represent them as the member of parliament and then once we're back in government I'd want to start us implementing a proper you know agenda for change for this country to help all the people who I'm seeing now who are struggling we can't help as quickly because we're in opposition but I just want to keep on doing this job Mm. for as long as I can. Well Emma thank you so much for coming on the podcast it's been proper canny. (laughs) (laughs) Hasn't it just? (laughs) The Codpast is an audio production from Extraordinaire.tv So that was this month's episode of The Cobcast. If you'd like to listen to our back catalogue or to know when new shows are uploaded, subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher or Soundcloud. Or follow us on Facebook, Twitter or YouTube to get notified when our new podcasts, videos and articles are uploaded. You can also find all our content plus the latest news and views on dyslexia at our website, which you can find at thecodpast.org. So until next time... Enlighten your right brain at thecodpass.org.